So thank you so much, everybody, for coming today. This is our first edition of Freeze Masters Talks outside of the fair, so a particularly exciting occasion. Um, we, for two years, have held Freeze Masters Talks at the fair in London, which takes place in Regent's Park every October. It's a fair for historical art uh, before 2000 and offers a unique contemporary perspective on old masters, 20th century art, ancient art. Um, and the, the series, which has been curated by Jasper Sharp, um, features contemporary artists talking about old masters and offers really unique insights into them as a result. Um, the fair's in a, a, a beautiful space designed by Annabelle Seldorf, and um, again, that sort of contemporary architecture sort of contributes to the, the atmosphere and the uniqueness of the fair. Um, a few years ago when I was researching the concept of Freeze Masters, um, I came across, and I was thinking about the influence of historical art on artists working today. I came across an article in uh, Tate Etc. magazine uh, that was written by Ed Ruscha, and um, I think you'd been asked to think about your favourite painting or a work that had influenced you, and, uh, and the work that you chose was um, a pre-Raphaelite painting uh, hanging in Tate Britain. Um, it was um, Ophelia. Ophelia by John Everett Millet. I thought this was a pretty surprising choice when I first saw the piece. Um, and, uh, and then as I read it, and had explained the influence it had on his work, the connections between that painting and, 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 and his, um, the years sort of, and the differences sort of fell away, and it just, it made so much sense. And since then I thought it would be fascinating to hear Ed speak more about um, historical art and the influence on his painting. So I'm thrilled that you're here to do that for us today. Um, Ed has a particularly busy week this week, I should say. Um, uh, his work is being unveiled, um, a huge mural as part of the Highline commissions tomorrow. Um, he's also installing at Freeze New York at Gagosian Stand um, his new bleach paintings and also has a show opening at Gagosian of prints and photographs. So quite a week for Ed and i um, really thrilled that you've found time to do this for us. Um, I also wanted to thank Ian Wardropper, director of the Frick, for taking part in the talk, but also hosting us in this incredible space. Uh, people don't normally get to come upstairs in the Frick, so this is a unique opportunity and uh, obviously a very intimate setting. Um, so we're very grateful to you for that. Thank you, Ian. Um, also, it's particularly appropriate that we're here uh, because Ed's work is actually on show at the Frick at the moment, quite uniquely for a contemporary artist, as part of the Hill Collection. Um, it's on show downstairs alongside um, Renaissance bronze sculpture from the Hill Collection. And if you haven't seen it, I would really <coughs> urge you to do so. It's quite extraordinary. Um, I also wanted to thank Gucci as well, who are our new partner this year. Um, we're really excited about this relationship. Um, they're going to be supporting the Freeze Masters talks and enabling us to put on fantastic events like this at the fair in October, um, as well as tonight. So thank you very much to them. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to Jasper Sharp, who, as I mentioned, has been programming Freeze Masters talks for us for the last two years and has brought together artists like uh, John Curran, uh, Glenn Brown, who's with us tonight. It's actually, so it must have gone well because he's come back for more. <laughs> um, Cecily Brown as well, uh, Luke Toymans, um, with institutions like the National Gallery in London, um, the Louvre, uh, LACMA, um, and the results that have come out of these have been really fascinating. Um, Jasper's going to tell you more about that, and it just remains to me to say thank you so much again for coming. Um, I hope you enjoy the talk, and I hope to see you at Freeze Masters in October. Thank you. I'm going to be extremely brief because I'm not the man that any of you have come here tonight uh, to listen to. Um, I am a curator for modern and contemporary art at the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. Uh, our museum is one of several museums around the world that has a bit of a problem, which is the fact that its collections come to a grinding halt at a certain moment in history. Our collections stop at 1800. Uh, the Louvre's collections stop at 1848, the National Gallery in London stop at 1900, and every year that we live now, we move one year away from these collections, physically, the time they were made, the context in which they were produced, and museums like this are constantly having to find new and imaginative ways to communicate with contemporary audiences. And for me, with all due respect to the museum directors and curators in this room, living artists are very often the most articulate and passionate ambassadors for historical art. 
And it's not really surprising because it was for living, practicing artists that many of these extraordinary museums turned from being private collections or royal collections into museums. The National Gallery, the Louvre, the Kunsthistorisches, they were all opened at the beginning for artists, first and foremost. I had the extraordinary privilege to work with Ed uh, in 2012 on an amazing exhibition that he curated from the collections of the Kunsthistorisches called The Ancients Stole All Our Great Ideas, uh, which was a huge honor, a lot of fun. Uh, I even got paid for it, which is just laughable because it was an enormous, enormously great experience together with Mary and Bob and so on. Uh, and it's great to team up again briefly for an evening back on the road. Um, Ian Wardropper doesn't need an introduction uh, because we are in Ian's uh, second home, uh, formerly at the Art Institute of Chicago and also at the Met and director here at the Frick since uh, October 2011. So, um, gentlemen, over to you. Thank you, Jasper. Um, I guess I'll start off just by welcoming you all here. I'm glad to see uh, so many people with an interest in contemporary art and old masters. Um, we're in uh, what were bedrooms of the Frick family. Um, I'm, I'm, we're sitting in what was um, Helen Clay Frick's bedroom, and on that side was um, Adelaide Frick, and behind us was Henry Clay Frick's bedroom. Um, so it's changed quite a lot since those days, and this is not a room that's set up for technology, so excuse the fact that we've had to kind of adapt to it, but I think it's going to work. Um, so I really enjoyed walking around the galleries just a few minutes ago with Ed. Um, one of the great pleasures of being in a museum is walking and talking and looking at art. And so that's what I'm hoping we're going to do today. Um, Ed has picked a few pictures that he wanted to talk about. Um, he's a severe editor, so when he came, he had sent me a list of 10 pictures, which were all pretty much pictures I would have put on my sort of favorite list. Uh, and he walked in and said, no, I'm just going to talk about seven of them. So he's, he's taken three out. Um, added one. And then, then we walked through, and he just added one at the last minute. So um, we'll see how this works. But um, I think we should just start looking at pictures. And this is a pretty good one to start with. OK, yeah. Um, when I grew up, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't have museums. Um, I grew up in Oklahoma, sort of an uh, urban farmer kid. And uh, so I, I first came to um, New York in like 1961. I think I saw this painting here, and um, I certainly came to the Frick. And, um, um, but I reflect back on times when um, art of this nature was meant to uh, conjure up feelings about religion and uh, being raised a Catholic. I was supposed to have religious feelings for something like this. And, uh, but going to art school and looking at it in a different way and growing up in the 20, 20th, 21st century, we think about pictures like this in a little different way. And um, I'd like to know, and I think we don't know that much about how Mr. Bellini felt about this picture. I don't think his writings even survive today, do they? Um, I'm not we have sure. some scraps, but not about yeah. this picture, no. Yeah. I look at this painting and I just see all these diagonals in there, and it just drives me crazy. Makes me uh, really appreciate the picture, and uh, particularly, it's much more vibrant in real life. I just got a good look at it, a good glimpse about 10 minutes ago. And the thing just blazes on the wall there. It's very beautiful. And um, it's got all these things going on in there, the diagonals, the diagonals especially. And it seems to me like it's sort of a crazy quilt of, of little compartments. And I see these compartments um, um, defining all this unusual stuff going on here. Um, even. Um, St. Francis himself, his chest is urging itself to be a diagonal. It's straining to be a diagonal. <laughs> and um, uh, he just is not there yet, but it will get there. And, and the library board in the back there is, is another kind of diagonal. And you've got these other kind of diagonals going that way. And so I think these, um, oh, another thing about this, it's this the title is St. Francis in the Desert. And uh, this is not the kind of desert I would usually 
think of as being lack of rainfall or because there's some lushness to this too. I mean, there's some greenery back there and some um, very hospitable kinds of feelings that go on in this picture, especially in the sky. And um, also deserts don't usually have castles and things like that there. But, and um, the, the uh, different breakups of this picture here is really interesting. Like, like the donkey is looking out the side there and looking at that cliff. And that cliff has its own sort of monster look to it too, if you wish. Below that in here next to uh, St. Francis are these sort of whale shapes and, and things that he must have, shall I say, goofed on as he was painting this picture. And the, the, the sort of tablet-like shapes of the rocks in the back there must have had some kind of metaphorical position in his mind when he was doing this. But uh, there's sure plenty to look at here. And um, if you get a chance, see the, see the original. Well, I'm just going to pick up on a few things that you said, Ed. I mean, one, just your response to the diagonals. And it's interesting, we're, we're actually uh, doing a book on the painting with, I think, six or seven different authors. One is just a study of the linear perspective of the work, which is really interesting because, you know, whereas the vanishing point in linear perspective is usually sort of mid-center of a picture, uh, in this case, the vanishing point is somewhere out here. Um, so if you sort of follow the diagonals, um, they'll all take you out to this point, um, which is just a really interesting use of this mathematical tool de developed in the Renaissance to guide the eye to what's not in the picture, which is God, light, whatever you want to call it. And typically in the scene of, of St. Francis receiving the stigmata, um, there's something literal that he's looking at, and it's usually white seraphim carrying an image of the crucified Christ. Um, it's not noticeably absent here. So it is uh, an image of somebody who is, as you notice, bowing to something. Both his bowing back is kind of, I think, also echoed by the tree there. It's, it's, it's bowing into him, um, whereas everything else, like the donkey, the crane, are looking out towards the emanation of whether it's spiritual or a natural phenomenon. Um, the other thing I, I, I like about this picture, and I urge you to come back to the Frick, we're just about to, um, we've just reinstalled it with two pictures that aren't normally side by side with it. Um, it's usually, it is always in what's called the living hall, um, where Henry Clay Frick interestingly surrounded himself by severe male images, uh, all portraits. Um, but for an exhibition we're just about to open, we're taking our two Titian portraits that normally flank it and putting them in a separate room. And to replace those paintings while they're gone for three months, um, we've brought in two other paintings that we borrowed from a uh, generous collector, um, one by Fra Bartolomeo and one by Garofalo. Uh, and they're penitential scenes of saints in the wilderness like this, both of St. Jerome. Uh, but what's interesting is that they're really quite small, very personal images. This is a, a big, grand picture. As Ed says, it, it's, it has real power when you see it in the gallery. Um, and in looking at those two small pictures, you see kind of a series of saints in the wilderness, you know, including these little uh, kind of study like this. And it, it helps you think about how um, he constructed this image. The other thing I love is we, we also had a group of Franciscan scholars here recently um, studying the picture. And they all started getting up and showing off their robes, because it turns out that there are regional variations in Franciscan robes whether you're in the north of Italy or in, you know, in Venice or different places, the way they knot the rope, everything has a slight, you know, has a slight different variation, which they can read, uh, which I, I just found fascinating because, of course, there are always these signs in pictures from another era that we may or may not be able to deconstruct. I mean, the phrases that you use in your paintings, for example, a hundred years from now will, may resonate in a different way than when you paint them today. Completely. 
So, um, I mean, I'm just going to follow up. Anything, any resonance of this painting in your work? Or um, This has all the makings of any picture. I think this picture would look great on its side. It would look great upside down. I mean, I think it, uh, you know, a successful picture can be looked at in many different ways. And um, if we did look at it upside down, it would have a new, uh, new meaning. It would have, uh, it would be just taking us back to the abstractness of things, and uh, which I think the artist himself somehow experienced when he painted it. I, I took a seminar. I took a tutorial once with A. Hyatt Mayer, who was the curator of prints at the Metropolitan Museum, and it was just on Rembrandt prints. So once a week, we'd go and look at Rembrandt prints to, together. And the th first thing he did was he always turned it upside down, uh, just to make me look at it just abstractly as a composition. And I think that is this is one of the most brilliant compositions. I think he's used every tool to kind of create the meaning that he wants within it. And it, but at the same time, it feels completely natural. Shall we move on to another picture? We can do that. Yeah. Okay, Hans Memling. Um, I was struck by seeing the original here and noting that it was so small. It's like this big. And uh, um, it's got a power to it, to me, that it's um, um, so stark and uh, probably aggravated a lot of artists of the period because it was so shocking. Um, and I think that most of the works here that we've seen or we're going to see will, would at one point in history would have shocked or irritated artists that um, had established a certain style. And I think that he moved beyond here and has done many portraits. The, another uh, strange thing about this is that I can't help stop looking at this guy because he looks like somebody on the street, like somebody I know. He, if you cut his hair a little different, he might be a baseball player. I don't know. He could be uh, Jose Canseco. I mean, he's got a certain look to it that is puts him into the 21st century. Most paintings of people do not. And so it's, it's really unusual, especially with Memling's pictures. They, they sort of cross centuries. Um, and I'm... I like to be aware of that. I mean, I every so often will see somebody on the street that looks to me like they're from 1950. And they're dressed like they are today, I mean, in today's clothing, but they still have a 1950 face. And uh, this man has a, a 20th, 20th century face somehow. Um, other things here that are just so simple and so fluid, like the little dart at his... Um, collar that comes down and uh, that little that little dagger shape, that tiny little thing right there is just what a perfect little accent and the, the fist in the middle of the picture is another thing that is just all by itself. The kind of aerial view in the back of this so-called city or whatever we're looking at back there, the landscape with the, the city of Bruges. Uh, Bruges. And, uh, and also um, that he's given a sort of lip service to the idea of a frame. And maybe he either didn't frame this picture or thought at the time, well, maybe I won't frame this, so I'll just paint a frame on it. And, um, and so I, I like the way that uh, this man's clothing here is sort of stops and the frame starts and finishes out the picture. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really subtle. I'm not sure if everybody can see it, but you can certainly go downstairs at some point and see it. But the, there's just a sort of slip of the, the window frame here. Uh, and his, his clothes are really clearly just in front of it. Just makes the point that he's in our space, he's indoors. And you're looking beyond him into the out of doors. And then I also love the way he's used sort of aerial perspective, but in kind of gradations from a very dark blue down to uh, the horizon line where the colors soften and get lighter that give, I think, more of a, a, a tangibility of a three-dimensional background to it. And then the, the way that just as a very 
uh, strong composition that the horizon line cuts right at his neck line. It is indeed a brilliant portrait. We don't know who it is. Um, and it has somehow both, I think, severity, but also a kind of very benign sense to him at the same time. I think most of these pictures come with stories, but I don't know that there is one here, but I, I try not to think so much about the backstory of a painting. Uh, and a lot of times it's very unimportant, but uh, um, to just see a picture cold and judge it on its own terms and not have to know what's behind it. Um, later on, it sometimes is interesting to know what's behind it, but in this case, I'm not sure they know much about this man or they know more about the artist than they do this man. Yeah, we don't know who it is. We, we know who painted it. We know it was a painting yeah. in Bruges because there are towers that are identifiable with the city. Um, and I mean, it is sort of interesting that portraits are meant to immortalize you, but oftentimes we lose the sense of who it is, and then it's just, does it stand up as a portrait of a humanity, as a work of art? You know, how do we respond to it? It's a winner. <laughs> All right. We'll look at another portrait. Yeah. OK, now. Um, Holbein's Sir Thomas More. Yeah, uh, he's got a sort of ambivalent um, look in his eye. I mean, he could be wicked. He could be cruel. He could be a, a saint, uh, which I think he was. Uh, he was, was later. Yeah, he was a saint later on. Um, and finally beheaded, I guess, uh, uh, um, for all that he did. But the painting here is, um, this is almost like, um, I mean, my favorite Holbein painting is, is uh, The Ambassadors, which is at the National Gallery in London. And, and I love that painting. It's full of all kinds of, it's like a 100-piece orchestra. It's got so many things going on it and, and so many different stories. Hearing, hearing these stories from different people, like the the curator there at the at the National Gallery, is great. Um, this is almost like a fragment of that, where it's a small sort of like focus into some bigger scene. I I keep thinking that maybe there's more to this this scene than just uh, Thomas More, but I I think that he's he's got a a true facility here with, with the way he deals with the satin and all that. Um, it's got a, you know, he's like, as a painter, he must have been considered something like a rodeo king or something. He could do lasso tricks. He could, he could do all this stuff. It's a lasso in there. Yeah. And, um, and then there's, I uh, look at the painting and um, I see something there that doesn't somehow fit so well and looks like it was added on afterwards, which is that necklace, this chalice-like necklace around him. Looks, there's something, I don't know, 20th century about that. It looks like it was added afterwards. And I know that it has a meaning to it. It was some kind of great honor that he received this. But for some reason, that the painting of it somehow doesn't jive with the satin and with the robes and all that. Um, not looking for faults in this artist's work, but I'm seeing something that, that is strange to me. I kind of like it for that reason. Huh. That's interesting. I never thought of that not working. I mean, it's, so it's a, it's a political symbol, basically. I mean, there's the Tudor rose uh, and the portcullis, which refers to the Lancasters and the, the political uh, his political allegiance. Um, are these S's? Is yeah, that the, the letter are. S? Mm -hmm. Okay. Which sort of comes from a French tradition of fairness or, or uh, sort of solidarity or firmness with uh, uh, the ruler. Um, and this was, you know, many of the grand people wore them at that time as a sort of particular symbol of allegiance, in his case, um, to a, a ruler who. Um, later caused his um, beheading, as you say. This, so this was painted in, in um, 1527. Holbein was a German painter. He came from Augsburg. Uh, but the most successful part of his career really was in England, 
um, in two stages in the uh, mid 1520s and then later in his career. So he had fairly recently arrived um, in England and painted Sir Thomas More, who had, was already famous. He had written Utopia, this great book about an ideal state, which was very far from the state that he maneuvered in, in Henry VIII's court. Um, and he had become Speaker of the House. Uh, he was soon to become Chancellor, really the most, most powerful man in England. Um, and then, as you know, he eventually, um, really because of his idealism and his adherence to religion, um, fell afoul of Henry VIII's desire to divorce and remarry and uh, his um, taking the English church away from the papacy. Um, so largely because he clung, he was so steadfast in his ideals, um, he lost his uh, life some years later, uh, 1535 is when he was executed. Um, and the, one of the great set pieces of uh, any museum's hang was the, is the way that Henry Clay Frick hung this picture um, opposite um, the man who was responsible for his execution, who was Thomas Cromwell, also painted by Holbein, uh, sort of facing each other uh, across uh, a fireplace. And I mean, as a classic parable of power, of course, um, Thomas Cromwell, who ordered the execution of Sir Thomas More after trying to extract a confession from More, which more refused to give, then of course Cromwell himself later lost his life because of crossing Henry VIII. So um, it, it certainly is a story of power. But it's interesting, I mean, we were just looking at, at the two pictures of the, of the Holbeins, and Thomas Cromwell is, um, it's not as great a picture as this one, first of all. It's a good picture, but not nearly as great as this one, I think. But it's also just such a different personality. It's so closed. He's hemmed in behind a desk. He's got this very suspicious look. Um, whereas, I mean, as I read more, it's much more of a sort of open, um, idealistic face, particularly when he's squared off with Cromwell. And he's got something here about, the, I don't know, the dancing whites, you know, the jump up, up the picture with this sort of white hot color that is in this little piece of paper he's holding here and then at his cuff and then around his neck there and then the whites of his eyes. So he's, he's got something, he's telling us something with these whites. Yeah, so it takes you up the same. I mean, what I love also is just that little lock of hair that's just poking out from the hat, just something just slightly off kilter in what is otherwise a very composed I mean, I, you know, the, the necklace to me is kind of echoed by the way that the, arm, the pose of the arm is. So he's, he's carefully composed it. I guess I'm, I'm not as uh, much of a, an opponent of the necklace as you are, but I see your point. He's not too happy, is he? <laughs> Another portrait? Um. Well, now he must have been laughed at in his time, Franz Halls, um, because he uh, went counter, I think, to most um, schools of painting. And I think the, the, the loose brushwork and the wet-on-wet uh, -wet brushwork um, was maybe not appreciated in his time. But I don't know that from history either, but I'm just looking at the picture itself. And uh, this man, he looks rather serious, but he could break out in laughter, as a lot of Franz Hall's paintings uh, subjects did. And uh, um, the so laughing cavalier, for instance. Cavalier, and he's got us living in the top one fourth of this picture. He's kind of looking down at us, but he's but everything is happening up in the top part of that picture. And then there's all this space before you get down to the, to the hand. So he's got very, a very long arm, if you <laughs> check his shoulder out. Um, but that's, that's notable. It's true in a lot of, a lot of paintings, exaggeration um, you know, for its own sake or for the sake of uh, anatomy. And um, 
I just I kind of like the way the, these uh, these quick uh, fluid brush strokes illustrate the kind of costume he's wearing. Also, the that little black dart from his cape that's coming around his collar almost looks like it's in the background rather than the, the foreground. So I'm, I'm looking at oddities in paintings that maybe don't mean anything, but to me they've got some substance. They tell me something. I'm, I'm looking at things that um, don't always make sense to me, but I, I get nourishment from it. Well, House had a successful career painting a lot of pictures like this, so people, people bought them. Um, this is one of his later works, 1660, thereabouts. Um, and it, you know, it, is, um, it is, as you point out, sort of fascinating how there's a kind of dis disparity between the face, which is fairly realistically painted, although once you get into it, it's, you know, it's got levels of abstraction compared to, by the time you get all the way down here, the yellow glove is just streaks. It's like a bolt of lightning or something like that, where he's really loosened up in all of this. And um, I mean, do you get any kind of sense of photographic in focus, out of focus in looking at something like this? Well, he was a, when, when was this done? 1500, 16, 16 yeah. And um, so to go back in history and um, try to um, assess what these people are are doing, it's a, it's a difficult uh, thing to, to come up with. Um, and I just, I look at it in the 21st century here and I see all kinds of very interesting things. Again, you could turn this painting upside down and look at it that way. Um, but um, it holds its own. You can, I, you can almost get lost in these passages here. You just, your eye just kind of gets, wanders in there and he's taken you into another place. Just the boldness of the, the streaks. I mean, the other thing that's great about Howells is um, the, the variety of colors that he gets in black and in white, um, where um, Theo um, Van Gogh, writing to his brother, talked about counting as many as 26 different colors of blacks in one of Howells' portrait, which is perhaps an exaggeration, but you know, as you get into it, you, you sort of see how many different colors he's working with in creating what is one uniform color. The same thing with the whites when you start getting into it. There's lots of different strokes and colors there. Um, I look at the bottom part of this painting and somehow it, I can't help but see the ash can school. Somehow he's influenced these artists, uh, or they have certainly seen his work, and, um, and influence is really, you know, the passage of information and, and uh, influence is always there. And um, I think that's, a, that's got some connection to the Ashcan school for some reason. Which Henry Clay Frick didn't buy at the time. He was, this mm. is what he was buying instead. But, I mean, Frick actually, what's interesting about him as a collector, he started when he was 20. He was already collecting what he could afford, prints and drawings. And then when he started making money, he collected contemporary art. It was mostly French, Barbizon School, Jerome, people like that. And it's when he moved to New York that he, then, then he shifted focus yet again to just old masters and really pretty much focused on that in the last 20 years of his career. But he, he didn't buy contemporary American at all. It didn't interest him. And there's very few American um, paintings in the Frick. There's a great uh, Gilbert Stewart of Washington. There's Whistler paintings. but that's about it. Shall we look at another? Sure. Okay, St. Jerome. Um, El Greco. Um, well, I, going through painting school and um, studying his work, um, it was uh, really something because he, this guy was like, he used rubber bands or something as as uh, models. He must have done something like that because he would have a way of stretching the subject. And uh, this is almost like the the France Halls in a way. But but um, this man uh, really had a way of exaggerating. 
and emphasizing anatomy in an unnatural way to make a picture actually work. And um, again, his, his arm would be very long uh, and his shoulders are twisted, but, but there's still there's a solid anatomy in this thing that has got uh, a real substance. And so I, I like this painting for that reason. It's, uh, it's placed quite high in the frick. It's over a, a fireplace, as you saw, where the, I think the, the length of the arm doesn't seem quite as unnatural looking from underneath. Uh, but we're going to be bringing it down to earth fairly soon. This is the 400th anniversary of El Greco's death. And um, so the Frick's going to bring our three El Greco paintings together um, later in the fall. And the Met's gonna, Metropolitan Museum is going to do the same thing, pull all of its El Grecos together. So um, people will have a chance to look at this closely, which, and it really deserves it, I think, both from the, just the beauty of the, the paint of what's going on in his um, Cardinal's cape, that all the, the richness, there's blues and reds and whites in there. Um, and then I, I love the kind of the compression of his head. We were talking earlier about sort of almost of a sense of Giacometti, I mean, looking from our 20th century perspective back. Um, yeah, he's got a way of making you look up at the head and down on his, on his hands. And he's minimized the anatomical size of the hand to tell that story. And so he's exaggerated wherever he felt like it was necessary, and it's, uh, he makes it so successful. I also like just the, the natural gesture. You know, he's, he's sort of looking up, but he's, he's got his thumb and his hand where he's reading, which is presumably the, the Vulgate, that is the, the translation from Greek to Latin of the Bible that, that, uh, El Greco, that um, Jerome had written. Uh, and there's also, I just like kind of the, sensuous gesture of his touching the paper. This paper seems to be you know, possibly disappearing. I still love touching paper, and you get that feel from it here. He might be smudging that a little bit. You think? <laughs> He's also, I also like the way that the beard kind of curls kind of against the, um, the vertical of the line. It's Frick bought it as a, Frick loves portraits, and and you happen to have picked a fair number of portraits, but that's one of the things that he loved the most. Uh, and this was bought originally, it was thought to be a, a portrait of a particular cardinal, a Spanish cardinal, and was later known to be, in fact, just a, a portrait, imaginary portrait, if you will, of uh, St. Jerome. And there's several versions of this, but this is really the best of all of them. Another Spanish picture? Yeah, this is a moody picture, and um, it's like all muscle and metal, and um, it's just got, um, I think the, this is a very bright reproduction of this, and I think it's more muted than this, um, but it's got, um, I, I, there's just so many things here. I mean, the heat, the, the reddish, the heat on that anvil there, and uh, with the accent and this sort of frozen moment as before the hammer comes down on that thing, he's got that, he's got the anatomy working and it's, it's sort of like people posing for a painting, but it still has action to it. So he's got both of those things happening. And uh, it, uh, of course he, he was his own voice. I mean, he, he had a, he, he was a great painter, and, and he could just about do anything he wanted to do. And some of it looks like he's left the auditorium in some ways, and then he comes back and, and does something else. He brings something else to it, and he's, he's just great. What do you mean he brings something else to it? Well, he, he just, it looks like something that he has added and then, and then uh, maybe he's taken his time. I don't know, you know, the, the, the time that it would take him to paint something like this. Uh, but it looks like it's something that he would work on 
leave and then come back to. And uh, finally, the resolution of the picture and the story and everything, he just makes it come together. It's, yeah, it's um, something of a mysterious picture. It's, it's relatively late in Goya's career, 1850, 15, 1820, because um, it relates to some of the black paintings, this kind of dark period of his uh, career. It's, it's quite a large canvas and has indeed a lot of kind of un just patches of color, unfinished, seemingly unfinished areas that all coalesce. It does seem darker, you're right. I think in this case the digital image maybe pulls out the, the brightness of it more. Um, I, I sort of like the fact that it's almost kind of three ages of men, the sort of boy, an older man, and then the, the man who's raising the, the hammer. And then they are presumably making a sword. Uh, uh, armor and, and uh, weapons were uh, one of the great uh, productions of Spain during this time, so it's a kind of a, 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 you know, slightly curved blade of a sword. Um. Well, throughout his life, he, he did uh, uh, many um, paintings and etchings and uh, of uh, uh, distorted anatomy. And uh, a lot of these people, they almost look like hunchbacks. And they have um, its own style of anatomy in almost anything that he does. And, and he was consistent about it throughout his life. Now, this Manet bullfight, um, about 20 minutes ago, I have came to realize, I've heard from Ian Wardropper, that this painting, it was uh, only a small part of a larger picture, and that's the thing that I would look at this painting. I, I love this painting, and, but something told me that this is not, this is a part of another painting, and, and I came to find out that that's true. Um, the eye, and he was a precursor of Picasso, and, and then I thought, well, Picasso would never leave a, a two-thirds of a bull out of a picture like this. And uh, he wouldn't do things like this. But then uh, I guess the original picture is maybe comes down to about here. And so it does have the, the entire bull in the picture. And um, I think he must have been laughed at in his time when he was painting like this. People must have thought he was a strange kind of figure. And um, you know, we have these three different people in this picture, and uh, one is almost like a like a um, a guard standing with a somber look on his face. The one in the middle is almost like trying to escape over that wall, like they do in in uh, bullfights. And the the matador, I guess, is wondering what he should do next. The bull is out of the picture almost, and so it's a strange thing. Also, that little white area underneath the bull's tail there it looks to me like it's incomplete, and. Uh, there should be a like a bit of a shadow there. It's like a hot white that doesn't belong. And yet, if we can see this whole picture, you don't have a you don't have a reproduction of this whole picture, do you? I, I don't. I'm afraid yeah. I'm not here anyway. But I mean, anyway, it stands on its own as this, and I like I like this painting very much. It's got questions in it, and and uh, that's what I like about art. Things that you know, that just can't be answered. Well, let me just explain to the audience that this, uh, it was, this is a fragment of a painting that, um, uh, that Manet displayed in 1863, and he was so severely criticized for it that he actually took it back and, and cut it in, into two parts, actually three parts. Um, the, the bottom part of the picture is now in the National Gallery in Washington. It's the dead Toreador. Um, he cut out a, a, a section in the middle where, where most of the bull was, and the painting continued uh, 
about another third in this direction. So, um, I mean, what, what's interesting is that then he, he, he cut it and then he reimagined the picture, both of them kind of um, working them differently. So here the, the bull's head actually went down and he added the bull's head here to complete it in this picture and made some other touches to make it. But is it, do you think you respond to the fragmentary nature, nature of it? Is I do, I've seen lots of paintings like that. Um, um, Thomas R. Benton has had works of his that were chopped up. I think there's some here in New York that are part of a mural and then they were taken apart and put in doorways and, and um, um, I mean, the world of art history is full of stories like that and paintings have been chopped up and, and thinned down and, and cropped before. This is uh, not something new, but looking at this, thinking that it was just a finished painting, uh, excited me and I, I saw something positive in here and I could care less whether this is cut in half or what. Well, Manet didn't mind and Frick didn't mind. Um, this, I've been told we have to sort of finish in a few minutes, but this is the picture you just threw in at the last minute because you wanted to. I saw this painting downstairs and uh, it's actually a better illustration for an El Greco that I could, uh, that I could think of that is uh, like, like a circus, you know, a circus of people here. And um, the very simple thing that he makes you look up to the upper part of the picture and looks down at the lower part of the picture is a way of twisting space and uh, twisting figures and still having them um, conform to the principles of anatomy. And um, I don't know what the, I mean, I could care less actually about the, the story behind this picture. You've, the you purification of the temple. Purification Christ of the chasing temple. Chasing the money yeah. lenders out of the temple. Yeah. And um, so I'm looking at it like um, a big jiggle of all kinds of colors and shapes and, and I could see it being appreciated by artists of today and artists of any age, really. And this was painted when? Um, around 1590, 1600s. Can we turn to an artist of today just for to close with? <laughs> Why not? Oh. <laughs> okay, well, I, I was downstairs and I, I saw this, uh, saw my painting that was painted, uh, I don't know, in the 80s, I think. And um, um, I saw it in conjunction with uh, the Hill collection of uh, Renaissance bronzes. And um, I, I was very happy to see that there's um, an interplay between these bronzes and my painting. And I can see, I can see some kind of connection there. My, my picture here is uh, almost like a, a satire in a way, or it's uh, not, I'm not painting history, but I'm painting an idea about history. And so mm, when I'm working out these things, I'll, you know, I've, I draw on history and, and I just put these things down and, and uh, follow blind faith to the end. And, um, that's maybe where this picture is. I love the exclamation points. They, so they you had to be there. You, you title it the 17th century, which is interesting because when I, when I first was shown an, an image of it, I looked at it for a while and I, I sort of said, that's very 17th century. And it turned out that was the actual title. How yeah. did you come to that? Um, well, it's just, um, I lived back there in, uh, uh, in my mind momentarily when I was putting this picture together and uh, and it just uh, ideas cooked and and I uh, just followed through on it and um, and used the old English lettering as a uh, sort of a satire in a way and um, and yet knowing that doing it in the 20th century is uh, here I am. 
And here's how the, the hills show oh, yeah. the picture in their apartment. Um, and we wanted to kind of convey to our public a little bit of the sense and excitement of the way that they live with 20th century, 21st century works with 15th, 16th, 17th century works of art. Um, I would never dream of doing an installation like this, but I love the, the freedom that they have to think of doing it with this series of uh, 16th and early 17th century bronzes of Mars and Hercules um, in front of your picture. I think it works very well together. It has this slight mock heroic quality to the bronzes, which I think is reflected in the tone of your picture. But, you know, I mean, the bronzes are highly serious, but at the same time, you have to take them uh, with a little bit of a sense of humor, which works yeah. through most of your art. But I like the sense of the sculptures and my painting as being some kind of strained relationship that is uh, almost comedic in a way and uh, stands on its own for that. Well, thanks, Ed. I think, shall we take a few questions from the audience? I think we if there are any, we've come to the end of our allotted time. I sort of feel that we missed a trick by not putting all the slides in the carousel upside down today for the presentation. <laughs> I think next time. Next time we're going to do that. Um, somebody have a question. Can I ask, um, uh, you, in the paint, your painting, uh, where did the image come from of the clouds? Uh, did it come from a photograph or did it come from a painting? Uh, what was the reference point for it? Do you remember? It more or less like comes from notions, and, uh, and I can work from photographs or clouds or uh, uh, actual. Uh, Life on the streets. I mean, it it it, uh, it comes from any number of sources, and I just put these things together, and there's no rhyme or reason where it comes from. But it's, if finally it comes together. And you you chose a lot of portraits tonight. When when was the last time that you yourself made a portrait? Um. Maybe three months ago. Oh really? Yeah. I thought you were going to say 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Did we get to see that uh, it's, a, it's a, actually a, um, a carpenter's tool that's pushed against a face like this. So it's a profile um, that I would call that a portrait. I was encouraging Ed to uh, also curate in some objects in Vienna from the Egyptian and Greek Egyptian, Roman, and Greek collections, and Ed walked all the way through the museum and got to Egypt, Rome, and Greece and just said, no, this is before my time. Yeah. <laughs> As if all of these guys are <laughs> contemporaries. Um, I'm just going to say thank you very much. Um, listening to you both just makes me want to go downstairs and look at art, which is uh, about the biggest compliment uh, I can give you. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's a very busy week. So.